वेलकम टू फिजिक्स डिपार्टमेंट फिजिक्स डिपार्टमेंट इज लोकेटेड एट द एक्सट्रीम एंड ऑफ द एकेडमिक कॉम्प्लेक्स इन लेफ्ट हैंड साइड वी हैव फैकल्टी ऑफिसेस एंड इन राइट हैंड साइड वी हैव फिजिक्स लेबोरेटरीज दिस इज फिजिक्स ऑफिस यू कैन मीट हेड ऑफ द डिपार्टमेंट फिजिक्स इन दिस ऑफिस द प्राइम रूल of the head of an academic department is to provide academic leadership at present professor subrajit ghosh has been taking the responsibility of head department of physics let's meet him in his hob office hello everyone I am Subhadeep, current head physics department, IIT Guwahati. First, let me congratulate you all for making the right choice by choosing engineering physics program over here. Um, this program is kind of unique and uh, not available in many places in India, but in here you will get the right mix of science and technology knowledge and would get ample scope of following your passion and even expanding the horizon. I wish we could meet in person now. Nevertheless, we can hold it off for a few months till uh, this pandemic goes away or uh, its intensity is much lessened. Over here, meanwhile, we are taking all possible steps to make you feel comfortable with learning in online mode. So take care, you all, and do not miss the department orientation on 13th of November at 6 p.m. Please follow. the special undergraduate website that is being set up in the physics department website where you will all you'll get all possible information till then take care goodbye in physics office you will find mrs leoni choudhury office superintendent and mr himanku dotta junior office assistant for your official work both leoni and himanku will help you along with mr ambaris in our official work in first semester btec students need to take two courses in physics one theory course called ph 101 and other practical course called ph 110 the course coordinator of ph 101 theory course is professor a perumal other course instructors are dr kanhaya pande professor b r borua and dr pankaj mishra you will have your class here in this kind of lecture hall Let's meet all the course instructors of PH 101. Okay, hello. This is Perumal. So I'll overall coordinate the PH 101 course, but I will take the second part of 101. So we will meet you on 16th November. Dr. Kanhaya Pandey. Hi, I'm Kanhaya Pandey. I'm going to take first part of classical mechanics PH 101. Professor B R Borua. Hi, I am Basant Ranjan Borua. I will take the relativity part of PH 101. So see you in January. Dr. Pankaj Mishra. Hi, I am Pankaj Mishra. I will take uh, fourth part of uh, PH 101, quantum mechanics. So see you in, uh, at the end of January. We have one department under graduate program committee called UPC in short. This committee oversees the conduct of all undergraduate courses of the department and recommends. the all syllabus of all undergraduate course offered by the department from time to time let's meet secretary of departmental undergraduate program committee dr charan chakraborty here is dr charan chakraborty hello hi students uh, so i am the dupc secretary uh, officially i welcome you to the department 
although because of this pandemic we cannot physically wel welcome you but uh, let us do this thing uh, online and then as and when you will come to the campus we will definitely uh, meet face to face and we will share uh, things uh, now as uh, of uh, as for your knowledge uh, let me tell you that any academic related issues uh, anything that you face uh, you should actually directly uh, talk to me you can talk to me you can email me and uh, there will be few faculty advisors also uh, allotted to each of you uh, that we will share on 13th of this month when the uh, orientation program happens. So uh, let us meet again on 13th November. Thank you. The BTEC student representative of DUPC are Mr. Tapan Moyuk and Mr. Gorango Ramakant Kane. So Hi guys, this is how actually everyone is going to see each other for the next few months. So this is Gibran and I am from 2018-2022 to engineering physics batch. I congratulate you all for getting into ITG and welcome to the physics community of ITG. Hope to meet you soon. Bye. Let's move to our physics laboratory where you have to perform PH110 laboratory classes. Professor S.B. Santra is Good the morning, first coordinator of PH110. Other course instructors are Thicken. Professor Subhradip uh, Ghosh, Professor Bipul Bhuya, Dr. Udoi Maiti, and Dr. Shobhan Chakraborty. So, um, so I'll mute myself, I guess, until you are begin to, uh, until you are yeah, ready to talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay.
So, Professor Jain, uh, we will wait for five more minutes because that uh, first year exam is going on and many faculty members are involved. Okay. So, it will get over by five to, uh, six thirty only. Uh, so, we'll wait for two and three minutes, then we'll start. Sure. Just let me know whenever you want to start. Okay. 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 Thank you. So when it's been proctored, then it's a bigger, uh, you know, chaos and all that. Right. <laughs> so how do you, uh, so it's not done in person, right? No, it's not done in person. It's that uh, okay. there's similar to what you said yesterday. Uh -huh. so we have a different, uh, um, you know, kind of software for uh, proctoring and manning uh, these things and so on. I, I don't exactly know how it works, but uh, there are like a student cannot uh, change the browser in which uh, he or she is writing, which means that it's trying to, um, you know, uh, sort of taking help from something else. Uh, and also uh, you have to look at the screen, so it's it should come in the field of view of the um, <clears throat> of the camera. So, so there has to be an external external camera that's pointed. Uh, no, no. It could be just the, your laptop camera and things. Laptop like that. or mobile camera. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we are living in strange times, you know. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Nothing can explain it better. <laughs> but US is doing very well now, pretty well. I mean, in the sense that. Uh, but yesterday, my friend in UK said that there's a, for the first time in many months, there hasn't been a single death in UK. And, and the second peak, uh, second wave seems to be over. I mean, the number of uh, infections were going like between 30 to 35 uh, over a period of uh, 10 to 12 days. I see. Uh, no, I, I, I heard the news that Boris Johnson said that 
now people are allowed to hug each other in yeah. the <laughs> but, the that's, but that's what uh, you know got boris in trouble last time because he was doing that and yeah. then he was in a, he he had to be intubated uh, it was a friend of mine was actually looking after him oh, and he was in a critical uh, situation <laughs> in fact <laughs> He was hugging he so many a, people, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh-huh. he did a video call uh, to us, uh, a Zoom call basically, where mm. Boris was on the background in the ICU, and uh, he said that this is what the situation is. It was very wow. green, and uh, j- just the way we were talking yesterday, it's similar to what India is facing now. Yeah. Well, in India also the numbers seem to be coming down, but you never know, you know, whether it's a trend or just a daily fluctuation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thirty thousand for India is nothing. I mean, you know, one forty crore population. It's thirty thousand right. is nothing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So then, yeah. yeah. So let's start. So welcome uh, to, to this fifth colloquium of this semester, and uh, it's our pleasure to welcome Professor Janendra K. Jain. from pennsylvania uh, pennsylvania state university uh, united state and uh, he is quite well known uh, researcher in strongly correlated theoretical condensed matter physics and uh, his main interest lies in the electronic system in uh, low dimensions and he is also uh, quite well known for the work on uh, the composite fermions that we will be talking more today and uh, he finished his bachelor in physics from maharaja college jaipur and subsequently uh, he completed his masters from iit kanpur and went for uh, the, uh, phd program in uh, stony brook university where he completed uh, his phd in 1985 and then after doing couple of post doc uh, he the first joined the uh the stony brook uh, as a faculty member in 1989 and further he moved uh, uh, to the place where he is right now in pennsylvania state university and uh, in, uh, in the, since then uh, he has been contributing quite a lot and for that he has been uh, awarded many prizes and uh, to name few uh, he was co recipient of oliver e buckley prize of the american physical society in 2002 uh, then uh, Alfred P Solon Foundation Prize in 1991 and then uh, Irwin W Mueller Professor Penn State University in 1998 and many more and recently this year he has been inducted as a member in the US National Academy of Sciences so without doing further delay i would like professor uh, jeng uh, uh, to deliver his physics colloquium talk on composite fermion and fractional quantum hall effect status report so I hand over the forum to Professor Jain. Uh, thanks a lot, Pankaj. Let me see if I can share my screen. Can you? Uh... Yeah, it's visible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's visible. Okay. So it's a pleasure to be at IIT Guwahati, even if uh, remotely. Uh, hopefully, I'll get a chance to come there in person at some point. Uh, So I am a condensed matter theorist and my job is to find to uncover the underlying emergent principles uh, that can provide a simple explanation for the complex behaviors exhibited by strongly interacting particles. Uh today I'm going to tell you about uh, a new system and uh, or not a new system i'm going to tell you about this system uh, so this is the uh, trace of the resistance of a system of electrons confined to two dimensions as a function of the magnetic field and this i claim is the most beautiful single trace in physics it has huge amount of structure as you can see and not only is the trace beautiful the underlying physics itself is amazingly beautiful uh in particular uh, we'll see that the uh, that this phenomenon uh it occurs because of emergence of new kinds of particles uh, and one of one of those particles are composite fermions so i'm going to tell you about how what what composite fermions are how they how they help 
explain the phenomenon of the fractal quantum Hall effect and uh, um, what more do we need to understand various features of the fractal quantum Hall effect. So uh, the outline is, as I said, I'm going to tell you, give you a background. So, you know, in this kind of talk, there is always this tension between two conflicting requirements. One is to tell you about some fundamental concepts which have been long known. And the second uh, desire is to tell you about the most recent exciting developments. Um, so in this talk, I'm, I have a mixture of both because I assume that a lot of you are not familiar with uh, this topic at all. So roughly half of my talk will be introductory. It's uh, something that all of you should be able to understand. Uh, in the remainder of the talk, I'm going to uh, uh, tell you about a new kind of paradigm, which is called the parton paradigm, and why, how that explains some other features of fractal Hall effect. And I'll end my talk with summary and outlook. Uh, I noticed that a very nice poster was prepared for this talk. Hopefully, at the end of this talk, you will know what these pictures and symbols mean. And I'm going to come back to this poster later in the talk. Um, so I don't know what the protocol is here for colloquia for asking questions, but as far as I'm concerned, it would be perfectly fine if uh, you could speak up and ask questions in the middle of the talk. Uh, OK, um, so before I begin my talk, I should say that um, I have benefited from collaborations with a large number of brilliant students and colleagues. And uh, this slide shows the photographs of many of them whose work I'm going to talk about today, time permitting. Uh, so Professor Jain, sorry to interrupt you. We can still see your first slide. Oh, you can only see the first slide. So what is happening? Only see the first slide and uh, also it's not full screen. So if you could make it full screen. Uh, I guess if you if you just press enter, then that should go to the if next I, if I press, Yeah, that should be fine. OK, so do you see next slide or not yet? It was working yesterday. OK, let me Maybe uh, you should press play. Yeah, play should work. OK, I'm pressing play. And uh, you don't see the second slide yet, correct? Oh, no, no. So okay, maybe you can unshare and share again. Yeah, let me do that. Uh, so sometimes what happens is if I share my entire screen, OK, let me share my desktop. Yeah, that will that will be good. And then hopefully it will work. Yeah. OK, so do you see my second yeah. slide now? OK. Yeah. okay. Uh, so first slide it's, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we can see your second slide, which okay, says out OK, so uh, you can see the poster. This is the, maybe you, I guess you have already seen the poster. Um, so this is a slide that has uh, that lists all of the all of my students and uh, collaborators uh, whose work I'm going to uh, mention during this talk. Um, so uh, I'm going to, I mean, so it's to, to, to get a feel for the excitement and the amazement that people in the field uh, feel, it's important to know what was known before and why the discovery was surprising. So, you know, you, can you cannot amaze a baby by pulling a rabbit out of a hat because a baby doesn't know that you cannot pull a rabbit out of a hat. So just to understand, just to get a background, you all know about Hall effect. Hall effect says, you know, before Hall effect, we had Ohm's law. Ohm's law told us that if you apply an electric field, it produces a current in the same direction as the electric field, and we can define a resistance. Uh, what Hall discovered in 1879 was that if you also have a perpendicular magnetic field, then the current does not flow in the direction of the electric field, but rather perpendicular to it. 
so this is something that we understand you know anybody who has taken a course in electromagnetism would know that this is coming from lorentz force law uh, and just the classical understanding of this also allows us to calculate the current and it turns out one can define a new resistance called the hall resistance which is given by the which is defined as the voltage perpendicular to the current path divided by the current and we can derive its value to be given by the expression here so it's proportional to the magnetic field inversely proportional to the density of charge carriers and then we also have e and c which are fundamental constants so this says that the hall resistance behaves linearly as a function of the magnetic field so that's why this and this was something that had been tested in thousands of labs for more than 100 years and that's why it came as a surprise when von klitzing discovered in 1980 that if you take a system of two dimensional electrons cool it down and expose it to a high magnetic field then initially it behaves as you expected so this is the hall resistance but at some point you start seeing deviations from this behavior and the deviations occur in the form of these plateaus where the hall resistance does not change at all now the the observation for which klaus von klitzing won the 1985 nobel prize was that the value of the hall resistance on these plateaus is very simple it's given by h over an integer times e squared so for example the value here is h over 2e squared this is h over 3e squared and so on so this was rather this was a shocking discovery because you know we are not looking at a simple atomic system we are looking at a very complicated condensed matter system which has disorder band structures effective masses and what not and yet we have uh, a measurement that is precisely quantized and universal uh, as far as we know this formula is exact it's been tested to a few parts in 10 billion um it's one of the most accurate measurements in condensed matter physics so it turns out that the explanation of this you know it was not predicted this effect was not predicted but it was explained almost immediately and the explanation follows from the fact that when you expose electrons in two dimensions uh, to a magnetic field their kinetic energy becomes quantized into what are called landau levels uh these are separated by an energy called the cyclotron energy and a quantum mechanical solution also tells you that the there is a finite number of states in each landau level so in fact the degeneracy of each landau level per unit area is given by the expression here where b is the flux through a unit area and phi not is called the flux quantum so the number of states per lambda level is essentially equal to the number of flux quanta penetrating the sample so now we can define another quantity which is called the filling factor you start filling lambda levels from bottom and when you run out of electrons you count how many lambda levels are occupied that's called the filling factor it's given by the density of the charge carriers divided by the degeneracy per unit area so as you increase the magnetic field there is more room in each lambda level and therefore the filling factor goes down as you increase the density you have to fill more and more electrons so the filling factor increases so it's proportional to the density but inversely proportional to the magnetic field now the reason why integer quantum hall effect occurs and i'm calling it integer quantum hall effect is because when the filling factor is an integer and for now i'm pretending as the electrons do not interact so i'm taking a model of non interacting electrons in this case when the filling factor is an integer we know this solution precisely so we know the solution consists of just an integer number of filled lambda levels uh, it is separated so it's a unique ground state it's separated from excited states by a gap which is the cyclotron energy gap 
I know the wave function of the state, so it's a Slater determinant, and I will denote this wave function by phi n when I have n field lambda levels. So in this particular case, this is phi two. Uh, I should say that there is also you you to really explain the existence of plateaus, you also need to invoke disorder, but that will not be important for the purposes of this talk. Okay. Um, Soon after the discovery of quantum Hall effect, there was uh, a topological interpretation of this uh, this quantization that was due to David Thaulis and later Duncan Haldane, and they showed that the Hall resistance uh, for a, in a periodic system can be uh, is equal to a Chern number, which can only take integer values for topological reasons. So this actually was the genesis of all of the physics that has to deal with topological insulators that has become very fashionable today. Um, I just wanted to mention this, but I'm not going to say anything further about this in this talk. Okay, so if the experimentalists had stopped doing experiments at that time, we would all be perfectly satisfied, but it turns out that this was only the beginning. There was another twist, and that was called the fractal quantum Hall effect. So uh, experimentalists, you know, actually they were looking for a Wigner crystal. They thought that if they could go to such low fillings, such small fillings, which means very high magnetic field, such that all of the electrons are in the lowest lambda level, then they would, then they would crystallize and form what is known as the Wigner crystal. So they were looking for the Wigner crystal, but they found a plateau where the Hall resistance is quantized at a value which is h over a fraction times e squared. So this was the first fraction to be observed. Now this was rather surprising because I just told you that quantum Hall effect occurs when there is a gap, and I told you that there is a gap when the filling factor is an integer. But now this is telling us that there is also a gap when the filling factor is a fraction. So when one third of the lambda level is fully occupied. So this gap cannot occur for a system of non-interacting particles. It requires interactions in a fundamental way. So that was very exciting. It's a strongly correlated state of the system. And soon material scientists got into the game and they improved the sample quality and uh, the experiments within a few years began to look like this. So the, you see there is one third plateau, there is two fifths plateau, three sevenths. I should also point out that whenever there is a plateau in the Hall resistance, the longitudinal resistance or the ordinary resistance shows a minimum where the resistance goes to zero in the limit of zero temperature. So this is the plot of the longitudinal resistance and associated with each minimum here, there is a plateau in the Hall resistance. So that's what fractal Hall effect looks like today. Okay, now at first sight, the fractal quantum Hall effect might seem like an impossible problem to deal with theoretically for the following reason. So being theorists, we want to write the simplest model, the minimal model that contains the physics of the problem. So here, the simplest model is in which you assume that the magnetic field is so high that electrons occupy the lowest lambda level. In this case, the Hamiltonian only has the Coulomb interaction energy, and by choosing the energy and length scales appropriately, I can write the Hamiltonian in this very simple form, which must be solved for electrons occupying the lowest lambda level. Notice that this problem has no mass. The electron mass has gone out of the problem. There is no kinetic energy because the kinetic energy for all particles is the same. It's not going to change, so it's just a constant, and we can forget about it. Um, so often we treat interaction perturbatively. I mean, uh, I, 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 Jen, I, yes. can I ask you a small question? Of course. I mean, uh, yes. in the sense that uh, 
so your disorder gave rise to the IQHE uh, and the the, pla uh, the plateaus were because the you know the chemical potential would have to spend some time uh, before it crosses uh, the Landau band, so to say. Right. Uh, right. So you have cleaned up the sample. Uh, and uh, the predominantly the energy scale that's left is the interaction energy now right uh, so uh, but you still have a, a, a subdominant contribution from disorders still there right so uh, right. so right. so the hierarchy says that cyclotron energy is much larger and then it's interaction energy and then it's disorder is that is that correct yeah so another I mean, what you're saying is correct. Another way to put is that um, you will see a fraction only if disorder is small compared to the gap. So even for integer quantum Hall effect, if you increase disorder so much that it becomes bigger than the gap, yeah. then yeah. it would destroy integer quantum Hall effect. So uh, in the initial experiments, disorder was sufficiently large that it uh, kind of uh, completely destroyed fractional Hall state. So it was large compared to the gap of fractional Hall states. Mm -hmm. So as you lower disorder, you start seeing, uh, as you reduce disorder, you start seeing more and more delicate fractional quantum Hall states. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I should say that if we could solve this Hamiltonian in the lowest lambda level at arbitrary filling factors, then this would give us the fractal Hall effect in its, in its full glory. Now, of course, that easier said than done. Uh, so typically in condensed matter systems, we know how to solve the problem of two interacting particles because you can just go to the center of mass and relative coordinates. But when you have three interacting particles, you don't know how to solve it. And here we have an Avogadro number of interacting particles. So Typically, we deal with disorder. I mean, we deal with interactions perturbatively. But in this case, we cannot do perturbation theory in interaction because that's the only energy in the problem. Uh, in fact, there are no small parameters in the problem. Uh, now you say, OK, let me still switch off the interaction and just to get a sense for what we are dealing with here. It turns out that there is an exponentially large number of degenerate ground states. Uh, so, for example, if you take 100 electrons at filling factor one third, so that means there are 300 orbitals in which you can arrange these 100 electrons, you end up with 10 to the power 83 different configurations of electrons which are all degenerate. So, we have this many degenerate ground states. Uh, this is a large number. So I like to give, I mean, just to get a feel for how large this number is, it's roughly equal to the number of quarks in the entire universe. If you take a typical sample which has a billion electrons, you end up with uh, this many degenerate ground states, and this is a number that uh, we cannot even imagine. You know, it's beyond human imagination. So. As is true for all of us, given so many choices, electrons are extremely frustrated. They don't know what to do. But nonetheless, experiments are telling us that when the repulsive interaction is turned on, there is a drastic organization which produces the enormously rich phenomenology of the fractional quantum Hall effect. And in particular, we know that at some special filling factors, we get a unique ground state, which is separated from other states by a gap. So the theoretical question is, what is this organizing principle? What's the mechanism of the fractional quantum Hall effect? How do we how do we even proceed here? How are we ever going to identify a single ground state from this large number of available states? So this ground state is going to be some very complicated superposition of these uh, 10 to the power 83 Slater determinants. What is that? Uh, and of course, as I mentioned, there is no small parameter to guide our thinking. So how do we proceed? Well, we must look to experiments for clues. So this is a problem where if we did not have experiments, uh, we, you know, theorists would not have been able to do anything at all. 
Now, what are we looking for in a theory? So here, let me. Uh, th so this is uh, an interesting episode uh, where two giants of physics, uh, Freeman Dyson and Enrico Fermi had a meeting and Freeman Dyson wrote an account of this meeting uh, in a Nature article in 2004. Uh, and this is something I came across recently and it's an interesting episode. So, uh, so Dyson thought he had a theory of strong interactions and he had calculated numbers which agreed pretty well with Fermi's measurements. So he made an appointment to meet with Fermi to show him uh, his results. So he took a Greyhound bus, went from Ithaca, where Cornell University is, to Chicago and to show his results to Fermi. So when he arrived in Fermi's office, he gave his theoretical graphs to Fermi, but Fermi hardly looked at them. Then Fermi says, and this is kind of interesting, there are two ways of doing calculations in theoretical physics. One way that I prefer is to have a clear physical picture of the process, process that you're calculating. The other way is to have a precise and self-consistent mathematical formalism. You have neither. So uh, Dyson was, Kind of devastated, he asked for me, "How about the, you know, comparison with your experiments?" Uh, for me, asked, "How many arbitrary parameters did you use in your calculations?" Well, Dyson thought about it. He said four. For me, said, "I remember my friend Johnny von Norman used to say, with four parameters I can fit an elephant, and with five I can make him wiggle his trunk." With that, the conversation was over. So Fermi says that he was really shocked because his whole research program was, program was demolished in a few minutes. But he was also grateful to Fermi because Fermi saved him from spending many, many years uh, chasing something that would have not worked in the end anyway. OK, so the point here is that we need a theory that has a simple physical picture, precise mathematical formulation, and as few parameters as possible. Okay, before I come to the composite fermion theory, let me mention many other, a few other beautiful works in the 1980s which uh, played an important role in the in the composite fermion theory formulation. One was a wave function constructed by Bob Laughlin for the one-third fractal Hall effect. There were also these ideas about uh, particles obeying fractional braid statistics that, that actually preceded the fractal Hall effect. These were due to Linash and Merheim and Frank Wilczek. Wilczek called these particles anions. Uh, and Wilczek also wrote a model where anions are thought of as either bosons or fermions with gauge flux tubes bound to them. So we'll see that will we'll serve as a model for composite fermions. And then there was this work by Zhang, Hansen, and Kivelson who modeled Laughlin's wave function as a Bose condensate of certain bosonic objects. Okay, so I won't have time to go into these uh, in any further details, but uh, let's just wanted to at least mention mention these works here. Okay, so the clue for composite fermions came from uh, looking at this experimental result more closely, and uh, you know sometimes if we see things, if 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 there are too many details, you know that obscures the basic message. So let me remove all of the numbers from here. And when I do that, I notice something very peculiar about this experiment. I mean, this experimental result. Uh, the peculiar thing is that there are some plateaus, some of these plateaus that correspond to integer quantum Hall effect, which we understand very well. There, there are other plateaus which correspond to fractional quantum Hall effect, which we don't understand very well. But yet, 
as far as experiments are concerned, they look identical. So you cannot really tell which plateaus belong to integers and which belong to fractions. So this tells us that the fractional quantum Hall effect is qualitatively indistinguishable from the integer quantum Hall effect. And therefore, there must be a deep connection between the two. There must be some sort of unification between the integer and, and fractional Hall effects. What is that? So that's what composite fermions do. They unify the fractional and the integer Hall effects. And in that process, they provide an explanation for the fractional quantum Hall effect. So let me give you the basic physics. Uh, a composite fermion is the bound state of an electron and an even number of flux quanta. I will call that even number 2m. Um, here is a composite fermion carrying two flux quanta. Here a composite fermion three, four flux quanta. Here it's carrying six flux quanta. Now I should mention right here because that this has been a source of confusion. Electrons are not carrying actual flux with them. What the electrons are carrying are quantized vortices bound to them. So a more accurate way of thinking about composite fermions is as the bound state of an electron and an even number of quantized vortices. But the quantized vortex is topologically similar to a flux quantum because both of them produce the same phase of 2 pi when you go around them. So therefore, this is a very useful pictorial way of depicting composite fermions. So how do they help us? Well, uh, 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 one yes, small question. Uh, so uh, the way it came uh, to you, uh, I mean, this is probably the most interesting part to me. So you just compared the uh, one over nu, uh, that's the filling fractions. Uh, between uh, so one over new equal to one over new prime or new tilde uh, plus minus two m uh, I mean minus two m uh, this is how you arrived at that uh, uh, so I'm so the question is the question how I how I thought of composite for me yes yes, or, yes 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 that so that's that's what I'm about to explain to you. Okay, okay, so I will show that how. So, you know, this was a time when uh, I was a young postdoc and uh, the fractional Hall effect had been declared to be a solved problem, but I could not understand it. But, uh, you know, and as I was trying to understand it, all of a sudden I had this idea which I'm about to explain to you. Um, uh, OK, so if you just bear with me for a minute, you will see what the idea is. It's OK. So. So let's say we start with an integer Hall state at filling factor P. And as you know, the relationship between the magnetic field and the filling factor is given by this expression. So I'm going to call this filling factor new star and magnetic field B star. I'm now going to do a thought experiment where I will attach to each electron an infinitesimally massless solenoid which has two flux quanta passing through it. OK, so that's this middle figure. Now, one can prove that a flux added in this way is unobservable. It does not do anything. So I have done nothing in coming from here to here. So this middle panel is actually a reformulation or re reformulation of the original problem. So this is integer quantum Hall effect of electrons. This is integer quantum Hall effect of composite fermions. So I have created composite fermions here by attaching two flux quanta, but the system still has a gap because these two problems are identical. So you may say, why am I doing this? Well, the reason is that once I go from here to here in the middle panel suggests a new mean field theory where I take the flux that is bound to the electrons and slowly smear it until it becomes a part of the external magnetic field as shown here. The magnetic field in the final panel is equal to the magnetic field I started out with 
plus two flux quanta added per particle. So this is the total magnetic field. We can use a similar relation as shown here and calculate the filling factor at the end. It's nu equals p over 2p plus 1. And if that in going from in if the gap does not close through the flux smearing process, then I have obtained here a state with a gap at a fractal filling. OK, so this provides at least a pictorial way of understanding how you can get incompressibility or how you can get a gapped state at a fractal filling that is analogous to integer Hall effect. Uh, so in so new star equals p is connected to new given by p over 2p plus 1. So in particular filling factors, integer filling factors 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. They map into filling factors 1, 3, 2, 5, 3, 7, 4, 9. And in general, I can attach any in even integer number of flux quanta, not just two, I can attach four or six, and I can attach them to be either pointing in the same direction as the external, mag as, the, as the original B star, or in the opposite direction. And in general, I end up with filling factors P over 2MP plus minus one. So Saurabh, does that answer your question? This was the motivation. Uh yeah, I, I actually followed uh, these three diagrams was not clear to me. So now I followed it. But okay. that that leaves uh, because you are the first slide that you showed had a even denominator. Well, that's probably going to come later. Yeah, that will come later. Okay. Okay, so I'll stop here. Yeah, thank you. Just to reiterate the thing, the what I just said just now um, uh, I can I can remove the first figure I can just or first panel I can say I can or I can do the things in the reverse order let's say I have electrons which are in the presence of a strong magnetic field uh, I for for some energetic reasons each electron captures two of the flux quanta to turn into a composite fermion and composite fermions now see only the residual magnetic field. The residual magnetic field B star is given by B minus the flux that electrons have captured. Uh, the filling factor for composite fermions, new star, and filling factor for electrons are related by this expression here. So the theory predicts that electrons capture even number of flux quanta to turn into composite fermions. Composite fermions themselves can be treated as weakly interacting particles for most purposes. And in fact, we can just neglect the interaction between composite fermions. Uh, the fundamental way in which composite fermions differ from electrons is that they experience an effective magnetic field, which is B star given by the expression here. They form their own lambda-like levels in this reduced magnetic field. These are called lambda levels, and nu star is the filling factor for composite fermions. Um, you may have, I mean, I mentioned earlier that a model for anions is uh, in terms of an electron carrying a fractional number of flux quanta. Here, when electrons carry an even integer number of flux quanta, they are fermions, but nonetheless, they satisfy the property of integral braiding statistics. And the second term here is actually coming from the integral braiding statistics of composite fermions. OK, and I'm going to show now that this physics motivates a single equation that gives wave functions for all eigenstates at arbitrary filling factors. So you may yeah, say, how is that? Yes, please. Uh, no, uh, see if you played that uh, original Hamiltonian with Coulomb interactions and no kind. Of, so you have this enormous number of degenerate ground states, and there is an uh, added uh, Coulomb interaction which lifts the degeneracy, presumably. Uh, 
but the question is that uh, if you do i mean if you kind of uh, thought uh, gedanken theory like as professor fredkin sometimes says that if you uh, do a first order degenerate perturbation theory of that system are you likely to recover this composite fermion picture so the question is whether uh, the solution to the original hamiltonian is described in terms of composite fermions so uh, i sh i should say that as far as i know in fact not only that i should say that there is no way to derive composite fermions okay this is something you can postulate uh, and then you can test it in many different ways and i am going to show you many of these tests uh, but uh, you will see that the theory so in fact this is kind of a nice segue into what i'm going to discuss now which is uh, eigen functions which we are going to test against the exact eigen functions so i'm going to give you a single equation that gives wave functions for all eigen states at arbitrary filling factors and in a few minutes i'm going to show you how those eigen these wave functions compare to the exact eigen functions so i don't know if if that answers your question maybe you have if you wait for a few minutes uh, then perhaps and then ask me again if if the question is not answered okay so uh, i have an unrelated uh, question uh, yes, so uh, this is uh, like i'm a little uncomfortable uh, about using the word mean field theory in the context because of this effective uh, magnetic field you talk i mean you're talking about a mean field theory or uh, why is this uh, i mean uh, are we doing any mean field theory here yeah so in going from here to here i'm treating this field so this field is kind of uh, located at the particle positions here but i have spread it so that it becomes an average field Okay. okay in going from b to c so okay. that's the sense in which a mean field theory is done but yeah. there is a more mathematical answer to this so in going from here to here i have done what is known as a chern simons transformation which is a singular gauge transformation that attaches a flux quanta to electrons then within chern simons theory one does a mean field theory where you treat this magnetic field as an average plus fluctuations and this is the average part of of the chern simon state okay so one can actually formulate it in a precise mathematical sense okay, okay. um so so i'm going to write one wave function one equation that gives wave functions for all eigen states at arbitrary filling factors so this is there is an infinite number of such wave functions and uh how do i write them in one equation well i i can do that because the single equation is a mapping so let's say you give me some filling factor new and ask me to write down wave functions for low energy states at this filling factor i'm first going to determine new star using the composite fermion physics then i'm going to write down wave functions for non interacting electrons at filling factor new star these are now because these are non interacting electrons so i i can list all of these wave functions and arrange them in order of increasing energy i'm then going to multiply by this jastrow factor where z is x minus iy it's the position of a particle in the complex plane this jastrow factor attaches 2m vortices to each electron to compare it to to convert it into a composite fermion so this jastrow factor has the property that when any particle goes around any other particle it gives me a phase factor of 2m times 2 pi so this is my wave function it turns out that this wave function is not strictly in the lowest lambda level and since i want to restrict my hilbert space to the lowest lambda level i am going to project this wave function by hand into the lowest lambda level and declare that this gives me wave functions for interacting electrons at filling factor nu in the same order of increasing energy 
So the ground state here gives me the ground state here. The excited states here give me the excited states here and so on. OK, in particular for the interesting cases. So when new star is an integer, this wave function on the right hand side is determined without any adjustable parameters because as I had mentioned earlier, phi n is known precisely with no adjustable parameters. The same thing remains true for low energy excitations at these filling factors. OK, uh, I had mentioned Chern Simon's theory. Uh, I am, so there are two ways to formulate composite fermions. One is through Chern Simon's theory, the other is through microscopic wave functions. So there is also a correspondence between the two, but in this talk, I will just confine myself to the microscopic wave functions. Uh, but I wanted to mention Chern Simon's theory in any case. Okay, so. So far, I have given you no reasons to believe any of this. And indeed, Horst Stormer, one of the discoverers of fractal Hall effect, asked the question, how real are composite fermions? Um, now, we theorists often fall in love with our theories. You know, we find them so compelling and so elegant that we think that they have to be correct. But nonetheless, nature has the final word. Physics is an empirical science and we cannot force our theories on nature. You know, nature does whatever it wants to do. Uh, in the case of composite fermions, this question is particularly important because these are very complicated particles. So I mentioned that each composite fermion is the bound state of an electron and quantized vortices. Uh, vortex was not a part of the original Hamiltonian. It's an emergent object. And in fact, a single vortex is the bound state of all electrons. So every single electron sees a vortex at certain point. It's a collective bound state. So it's also a topological object because a vortex has the property that a full circle around it produces a phase of two pi independent of the uh, size of the loop. It only has to go around the vortex. So a composite fermion is also a very complicated object. You know, even a single composite fermion is a bound state of all electrons. So the question is, do they actually exist? If they do, in what sense do they behave as particles? Now, often the most convincing proofs come from experimental confirmations of some very simple predictions that originate from the theory. In this case, we are fortunate in two respects. First is a system of non-interacting fermions has a lot of phenomenology. So you can open any book on condensed matter physics, look at all of the things that electrons do, and we can investigate the same phenomena for composite fermions. So one can make lots and lots of unambiguous predictions from composite fermion theory. The second fortunate aspect is that experiments also show a remarkably rich phenomenology. So let me begin with experiments. Uh, you have seen this before. Uh, if So at maybe 10 years ago, an experimental colleague of mine sat down and counted the number of minima in fractal hall experiments, and he he found that close to 100 fractions have been observed. Um, the number of fractional quantum hall states is actually bigger than the number of fractions because at any given fraction you can have many different types of fractional hall states with different filling, different spin polarizations or different valley polarizations and so on. Um, Experimentalists then can go ahead and measure properties of all of these different fractal hall states. For example, their gaps, collective modes, spin polarizations, spin wave excitations, and so on and so forth. And they can measure these properties not, not only in gallium arsenide quantum wells where this, this trace is taken from, but they can also measure them in graphene, in double layer graphene and so on and so forth. So lots of different systems show fractal Hall effect. So one can collect a lot of data. It's a data rich field. Now, 
as though that were not enough, we theorists can produce our own data on the computer. So we can take small systems, let's say of n electrons, put them on the computer. So typically we use a geometry which is called the spherical geometry. That means we put electrons on the surface of a sphere subjected to a radial magnetic field. The magnetic field is given by an integer 2q, which is the number of total flux quanta passing through the surface of the sphere. So we can take lots and lots of different n 2q systems and do exact diagonalization of the Coulomb interaction. And I'm showing you a typical result here. So for these mini systems, we know everything. We know all the exact eigen energies, exact wave functions, and so on. Okay, so how does the composite fermion theory work? So let me begin with explanation of the fractional quantum Hall effect. Now, this set of slides was given to me by Horst Stormer, and I think these are the most beautiful slides in this field. So this panel has been repeated twice uh, for reasons that will become clear in a second. Uh, so there are integer Hall states, then you go to higher magnetic field around filling factor one half, you see many fractional Hall states. So this is one third, this is two fifths and so on. You go to yet higher magnetic fields around filling factor one fourth, there are many more fractional Hall states. So these are what we are trying to explain. Now let me do something which is the simplest thing one could do, which is to take the upper panel and plot it as a function of the effective magnetic field as seen by composite fermions carrying two flux quanta. So remember the formula for B star and B differs by a constant. So I'm going to move the upper panel to the left by that constant like this. When I do that, you notice that there is a remarkable one-to-one -one correspondence between these fractions and the integers. So one third, two fifths, three sevens, four nines, they map into these integers. In fact, the correspondence is so compelling that I can remove the fractions and I can put integers in place. So this just looks like integer Hall effect of some fermions. Now these higher order fractions, more complicated fractions, they map, they have a one-to-one -one correspondence with the simpler fractions. So I can I can think of these as simpler fractional quantum Hall effect of composite fermions carrying two flux quanta, but I can actually move the upper panel further toward the left and plot it as a function of the magnetic field seen by composite fermions carrying four flux quanta. And then these fractions can be understood as integer quantum Hall effect of those composite fermions. Okay, so but just that's like, a, but that's a very good uh, test of composite fermions, right? Yeah, yeah, this is uh, this is an amazing test. Yeah, but this is not the only amazing test. Okay, we'll see more. Okay, okay if you bear with me. Yeah. So, sure. um, so you know these these maxima these are actually evidence for lambda levels. You know lambda like levels of composite fermions. Uh, we now have a physical mechanism for fractional Hall effect as the integer quantum Hall effect of composite fermions. This correctly predicts these sequences, P over 2P plus 1, P over 4P plus or minus 1. Um, this explains all of the fractions in a unified manner, but it also unifies fractional and the integer quantum Hall effects. So the fractional Hall effect is equal to the integer quantum Hall effect of composite fermions. I mean, a remarkable thing here is that, you know, we had this problem with humongous degeneracy, but when you look at the problem through the lens of composite fermions, you find unique solutions at filling factors like one third, two fifths, three sevenths, et cetera, where, uh, so somehow this, this exponentially large degeneracy disappears like in a magic to produce unique ground states. Um, this is nothing special to gallium arsenide system. So this is uh, actually a, a trace 
for uh, fractal hall effect in monolayer graphene. Again, here the fractions that you see, they completely match the prediction of the composite fermion theory. In fact, this paper was uh, written more for uh, fractal hall effect in double layer graphene, where they found that a generalization of composite fermion theory to double layer systems again explains all of the uh, fractions that they observe. Um, so the experimental data I showed you earlier was from 20. Yes, please. Uh, does uh, similar data exist for uh, single layer graphene? Because the kinetic energy is very large. Uh, yeah, so the interaction. That's this is single layer graphene. Double layer, right? No, this is single layer. Oh, this single layer. OK. Yeah. So in single layer graphene, there is they see lots and lots of fractions and they match precisely the fractions which are expected from composite fermion theory. But how and this is double layer. Oh, OK, but how do you reconcile that the kinetic energy is about 2.8 electron volt? Uh, where does that go? I mean, uh, no, even in graphene, once you apply a magnetic field, you have lambda levels. Yeah. And it turns out that the n equal zero lambda level for graphene is very similar to the physics of that is same as that for n equal zero lambda level of gallium arsenide, let's say. And once electrons are confined to confined to that, that physics takes over. Okay. 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 Right. Yeah. So these are some extremely high quality samples which were uh, which were produced only recently. So these samples have mobility of, for those of you who are experts, 40 million centimeter square, 40 million volt per centimeter square second. And here you see, I mean, they see many more fractions. So they see fractions up to 14 over 29 from this side, 16 over 31 from this side. They again follow precisely these sequences. Okay. Now, one of the one of the tests of theory is to push it into the unknown limit. So let's push these fractions to the extreme. In that limit, this this goes into filling factor one half. Well, this is filling factor one half. This maps into electrons at zero magnetic field. So if there are composite fermions here, they see no magnetic field at all. So that's remarkable, right? We have electrons in an extremely large magnetic field. By some magic, when they convert into composite fermions, composite fermions see no magnetic field at all. So here, the effective magnetic field for composite fermions is zero. Well, what would they do? What would fermions do in a zero magnetic field? They would form a Fermi C. So this actually explains a long-standing puzzle the puzzle was why is there no fractional Hall effect at filling factor one half? And the reason is that here we have a Fermi C of composite fermions. Fermi C has no gap, and therefore there is no fractional Hall effect. But Fermi C has lots of other very interesting properties. You know, so it's a dramatic prediction because remember there was no kinetic energy at all in the original problem. There was no mass. Here we have a Fermi C and that's arising entirely from interactions. Now, this Fermi C is fully confirmed by experiments. It allows a direct measurement of the effective magnetic field for composite fermions. Let me just show you. I mean, I, I should, I'm going to show you some results, but one ha always has to keep in mind that even though it's an ordinary it looks like a garden variety Fermi C of composite fermions. It's actually a highly non-trivial, non-Fermi liquid state of electrons. So here are some of the original experiments that confirmed the Fermi C of composite fermions. So the idea is to go slightly away from filling factor one half. When you are slightly away, so at filling factor one half, composite fermions see zero magnetic field. When you're slightly away, they see a tiny magnetic field. And composite fermions would then execute large cyclotron orbits as, as 
the radius of which is related to B star as seen by composite fermions. Um, just as, as con in contrast, if you had classical electrons in the external magnetic field, they would execute very tiny cyclotron orbits. So it turns out that the cyclotron orbit, the radius of the cyclotron orbit is related to the Fermi wave vector for composite fermions. The Fermi wave vector is predicted to be related to density given by this formula. So there is a, an unambiguous prediction for what the radius of the cyclotron orbit for composite fermions should be. And there are many experiments which have measured this radius. The simplest one conceptually perhaps is you throw in current through this constriction, you capture it into another constriction through which you know the bending of the orbit of whatever is carrying current. And indeed, the radius is consistent with what is predicted by this formula. In fact, uh, but one yeah. thing, I mean, even at half, uh, I mean, if we do not shift our uh, upper plot leftward, uh, there is a time reversal symmetry breaking, uh, which should give us a, you know, a sort of turn number and a Hall effect. Uh, why, why that is, uh, I mean, from that perspective, why is it uh, missing? So, so uh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, so there is Hall effect at filling factor one half. So I guess your question is, if I just take composite fermions at zero magnetic field, it seems that there is no Hall voltage. But yeah. in real experiments, there is a Hall voltage there. So that's that's extremely, that's a very nice observant question. Uh, the reason for that is that when composite fermions are, uh, so the picture that I'm giving you is overly simplistic, but it's correct. Nonetheless, the point is that when composite fermions are moving, they are carrying this flux with along with them. And this flux through Faraday's law actually produces a, a hall voltage in the perpendicular direction, okay? So if one does the calculation correctly, you find that indeed the system is uh, um, gapless, but there is there is Hall voltage uh, corresponding to filling factor one half. So maybe we can go into this. Okay. Um, but it's indeed true that if you are sitting exactly at one half, an electron would turn around but a composite fermion would just go straight. And the experiments I showed you are confirming that the current is actually going straight if you are at filling factor one half. So okay. these are more accurate measurements of the Fermi wave vector. So these are commensurability experiments from Princeton, from Mansur Shaigan's group. And they impose a periodic one dimensional potential uh, density modulation, very weak, very gentle density modulation. But the prediction is that whenever the cyclotron orbit of composite fermions is commensurate with the period, you would see a minimum. Uh, these vertical dashes are the predicted positions, and you can see they agree very well with what they see experimentally. But isn't this uh, bringing in electric field as well with the density modulation? So here, what the density modulation is extremely small. It's on the order of 1% or even less than 1%, you know, 0.1% maybe. And you're right that there is some electric field, but the governing physics is that because of density modulation, the effective magnetic field seen by composite fermions is also, also has a modulation. And okay. it's that modulation that actually dominates the physics here. Okay. Okay. Uh, so but thank you for you yes. equal to half. Uh, is it a Luttinger liquid or it is a, just uh, something else? Meaning you said non-Fermi liquid. Is it like a power law singularities? No, it's a two. Uh, is it a Luttinger liquid? Two-dimensional Luttinger liquid. 
it's it's not a Luttinger liquid in the sense we know Luttinger liquids in one-dimensional systems. It's an example of a non-Fermi liquid. So if you, uh, uh, from the vantage point of electrons, it's a very complicated object. From the vantage point of composite fermions, it seems to behave more or less like a regular Fermi liquid. Fermi liquid, okay. yeah. Uh, it it's so the so I have the phrase Luttinger area for the Fermi surface um, area Luttinger rule. It should be Luttinger rule for the Fermi surface area. So the size of the Fermi surface satisfies Luttinger's theorem in the sense that the um, in the sense that it's uh, the Fermi wave vector is what you expect you would expect for non-interacting fermions. Okay. So, are there any de uh, experiments on this? Uh, yeah. So, in a sense, you can think of these as Shubnikov de Haas oscillations. Yeah. Okay. So, so here these are on two sides of the of filling factor one half. And you can actually analyze these quantum oscillations through, you know, Kosovich uh, formula, and you can get uh, so they work out beautifully. I mean, they can be interpreted as Shubnikov de Haas oscillations or composite fermions. Mm -hmm. Okay, how am I doing on time? Uh, Pankaj. Yeah, I think it's okay. Uh, you have already crossed uh, hype minute past. But you can, uh, yeah. if you are free and uh, you do not have anywhere to go, I mean, uh, we are all yours. Yeah, you can continue. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I have a doctor's appointment in an hour. So I can, let me, I think these questions are extremely useful. Uh, let me continue for maybe 15 more minutes if that's okay with you and then we can talk wherever I am, you know, depending yeah, on the fine. questions. Sure. Okay. So, um, there was this question earlier uh, about whether these or to what extent this, this theory represents the solutions of the original electron problems. So, that's what I'll come to now. I will show results from two independent calculations. One is just brute force exact diagonalization of the Coulomb Hamiltonian on the computer. The second is composite fermion theory. Neither of these calculations contains any adjustable parameters. So I get whatever result I get. I have no way to adjust the result as I'm going along. Okay. Um, so I think I showed one of these figures, I think this one earlier on. So these are exact diagonalization spectra for filling factors one third, two fifths, three sevenths in the spherical geometry. The systems are finite, but not too small. This is a 14 particle system, 16 particles, 18 particles. I should also point out that these are very large systems. So we don't have 10 to power 83 states here, but we have millions of states. So this number on top tells you how many independent states I have in this tower. And this number is from 100,000 to several million. So for example, a single wave function here is a linear superposition of 2.3 million basis functions. So to, to write this wave function, I need 2.3 million parameters Okay, for this wave function. Uh, so the what what is shown in these figures is the extremely low energy part of the spectrum only. I should also say that all of the structure here is arising from the interaction. So if we switch off the interaction, all of these millions of states they would collapse into a single energy. All right. Now what does the composite fermion theory tell us? So for three sevens, composite fermion theory would say that the ground state consists of three filled lambda levels of composite fermions and the excited state or the lowest excited states would consist of uh, an exciton positive fermions, a particle hole pair. And in fact, I know the wave functions for these. But before I go to wave functions, I can just 
count, I can calculate the quantum numbers of these states just based on these figures. And the relevant quantum number in this geometry is the orbital angular momentum. And just a simple back of the envelope calculation gives me the correct quantum numbers. So that's encouraging. But I can now go further and take these wave functions and these wave functions are very complicated. It took us many years to learn how to calculate with them. But I calculate the Coulomb expectation values in these wave functions and I get the dots shown here. So you can see that the ground state, the low energy excited states, they're all given almost exactly by the composite Fermion theory. So this would be a non-trivial comparison even for a single state, but we find this level of agreement for all cases that we have considered. So I'm showing you just some of the larger systems here, but we have studied hundreds of systems and this is the level of uh, comparison we have. Uh, we can go away from these special filling factors. Is there a question? No. So we can go away from these special filling factors. Again, the composite Fermion theory continues to work. We can actually start. So I showed earlier ground state and this low energy excited state, but there is another band here, and these correspond to excitations where up to h bar omega c for composite fermions. So I, I either excite a particle across two lambda levels or two particles across one lambda level. And consideration of these gives me the dots shown here. And you see that one can slowly construct states in higher and higher bands as that are observed in exact diagonalization studies. So how real are composite fermions? Well, Horstmer answered the question they are as real as Cooper pairs. In fact, you know, once you accept composite fermions, there is a kind of paradigm shift in one's thinking. So we can now start asking lots of questions that we could not have asked earlier. So for example, there was a question earlier in this talk, how about shubnikov dehas oscillations? So that's one of the questions you can ask, what's the mass of composite fermions? What's their magnetic moment? Do they show fractional quantum Hall effect? We already talked about their integer Hall effect. We talked about the Fermi C, how about their thermal power? How about their cyclotron resonance and so on? So a lot of these questions have been asked and most of them have been answered. And um, they can be found in several books and review articles. Okay, let me mention a couple of things uh, where we have made progress recently and I will probably not have time to go into the part on paradigm because that's going to take at least half an hour. Um, so here, so given, given the agreement between theory and computer experiments, we can say, okay, now I'm going to go ahead and explain real experiments quantitatively. You know, we already have a qualitative understanding, but I'm going to explain I'm going to calculate numbers. It turns out that when I try to match numbers, the agreement is not at the level of a few percent, but it's at the level of 50 percent. You know, the, the problem is, the difficulty is that experimentally there are many things which we, uh, which we have put to zero in our computer experiment. So for example, we did not take into account finite thickness of the wave function. We did not take into account lambda level mixing. We did not take into account disorder. All of those things were conveniently set to zero in computer experiments. It turns out our understanding of those features is not as good as our understanding of fractional quantum Hall effect. So that's what is the bottleneck, you know. Uh, so here is one comparison where a lot of progress has been made. This has to do with uh, spin phase transitions in fractional Hall effect. So it turns out that, if, let's say I could somehow, if I could change the Zeeman splitting of electrons from zero to some large value, and let me here consider filling factor four nines, 
which maps into filling factor four of composite fermions. So when the J1 energy is very small, I have a spin singlet state. I have two spin up lambda levels occupied, two spin down lambda levels occupied. As I raise the J1 energy, at, at some point I get this partially polarized state where I have three up and one down, and eventually I get a fully spin polarized state. So it turns out that experimentally they can see these phase transitions and these red stars or the blue stars are the positions of phase transitions where uh, or the, the values of Zeman energies where a transition takes place from a fully polarized state to a partially polarized state at filling factors which are given on top. So if we just do a calculation without including any of these other corrections. We get this result here. So it's not too bad. It captures the qualitative physics. It, you know, it gives you like a tank-like structure. But recently we have included lambda level mixing and we have included finite thickness effects. And after all of that, the theoretical results are given by these red circles and you can see that there is an extremely good agreement between what the theoretical prediction is and what is observed experimentally. Uh, Professor Jain, uh, why, uh, how do you uh, tune the Zeman energy? It comes with, uh, it's a sigma dot B. So, uh, yeah. the, uh, so when you change the Zeman energy, then the orbital uh, coupling uh, also increases, right? I mean, so the cyclotron gap increases. So is, uh, yeah, yeah. am I missing something? So, no, you are not missing anything. So there are two ways of doing this. One is that you, let's say you start with, in, okay, so you can apply a, an ex additional magnetic field parallel to the 2D layer. This additional magnetic field is going to not change the filling factor. It's not going to couple to the orbital degrees of freedom, but it's going yeah. to increase the thermal energy. Yeah. Okay, that's one way. The other way is to do the same experiment at different magnetic fields. Okay, because, uh, or I should say, if you change, let's say we want to stay at the same filling factor, but change the Zeman energy, one way to do that is to use different densities because for different densities, the same filling factor is obtained at different magnetic fields, and therefore these have different Zeman energies. Yeah. But these experiments were done by what is known as, a, known as tilted magnetic field, which is the first yeah. uh, method I had suggested. So you tilt the magnetic field while also increasing its value so that the perpendicular component does not change. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me um, also say that, okay, this will be the last thing I will consider before I conclude the talk because I have to go also, sorry for taking much longer than I had anticipated. But you remember this question, uh, you remember when I discussed fractional Hall effect, I said that experimental, experimentalists were looking for a Wigner crystal. So you may ask, well, what about the Wigner crystal? It turns out that if you go to sufficiently strong magnetic fields, eventually we expect a Wigner crystal. Um, or if you can increase lambda level mixing, and that's captured by a parameter called kappa, which is the ratio of the Coulomb energy, where L is the magnetic length, to the cyclotron energy. So if we increase kappa, there is more and more mixing with high, higher lambda levels, and that also stabilizes or that favors the crystal phase. So recently we calculated the phase diagram. So this is in the vicinity of one third. So you notice that at filling factor one third, you can go on increasing lambda level mixing and it remains at one third, but in between one third and two fifths, you get into a crystal phase at some point. Similarly, between one fifth and two nines, there is a crystal phase uh, that appears even in the absence of lambda level mixing. So, but this is a crystal of composite fermions. So we were very pleased to see that experiments confirm this phase diagram. This is an experimental paper that appeared last year. 
So these are our theoretical phase diagrams. This is experiment. So when you see an open circle, that means an, it's a liquid fractional hall state. So as far as they could see, it's that state. But in between one third and two fifths, they find that there is a transition from a liquid state to a crystal state, almost exactly where we predict theoretically. So the agreement is somewhat fortuitous, but certainly the experiments confirm the theoretical phase diagram, at least in a semi-quantitative fashion. OK, so this brings me to the uh, to this poster. You can hopefully now understand the poster. So at zero magnetic field, we have a Fermi C of electrons. When we go to filling factor half, there is a Fermi C of composite fermions. So this poster does not show all the other fractional hall states of composite fermions. OK, it only see, shows a Fermi C. When you go to still higher magnetic fields, eventually you get a Wigner crystal of either electrons. So this is a crystalline phase here. You can see electrons are arranged in a triangular lattice, or you see a crystal of composite fermions. OK, so with that, let me go to the final slide. OK, so the fractional quantum Hall effect is one of the best understood strongly correlated systems of electrons. The prominent phenomenology is correctly predicted both qualitatively and quantitatively in terms of weakly interacting composite fermions. A generalization of the composite fermion theory known as the parton construction, which I did not have time to talk about it. Um, it offers plausible explanations for certain other very delicate fractional Hall states which do not conform, which cannot be explained in terms of non-interacting composite fermions. So I didn't have time to talk about that. Um, let me say that the field of quantum Hall effect has been the birthplace for the first realization of many remarkable concepts. And just to name some of them, anions, composite fermions, non-abelian anions, Majorana particles, topological quantum computation, 1D Lattinger liquids, skirmions, two and three dimensional topological insulators, quantum spin Hall effect, quantum anomalous Hall effect, and fractured churn insulators. So the discoveries of integer and fractional Hall effects, they marked the beginning of the topological revolution in condensed matter physics. Uh, in fact, the integer and fractional Hall states still remain the best topological insulators to date. You know, because they don't require any symmetry for their protection. Um, OK, I think this is a good time to stop. So I'm going to uh, uh, end my talk here and thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah. Very beautiful talk. Yeah. Beautiful talk. So, uh, before I take the question, we will have lots of questions later on. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe if you can make time for us next time, you give the lectures. Yeah. Interesting so, things here. Unfortunately, so, I have to leave within five minutes, but maybe okay. if there are questions. So can we have one question from the YouTube? Uh, some students are watching there. And one yes. question has come uh, that please explain physically what is the origin of uh, zero resistance? Oh, OK, that's that's a very interesting question. So the origin of zero resistance is so in the fractional Hall state or integer Hall state, uh, the, the bulk is gapped. OK, uh, so there is. There is no trans. You could ask the question if the bulk has a gap, why is there any transport at all? Uh, the transport occurs because of the presence of edge state. So now we have, in the modern language, a better understanding of this. So these are systems with non zero churn numbers, and therefore that comes with the presence of gapless edge modes. And so long as these edge modes are not coupled, you know, so. In both integer and fractional Hall effects, the edge states have the property that on one side of the sample, edge states move in one direction. On the other side, the edge states move in the other direction. 
So, so long as the edge states are sufficiently far from each other, there cannot be any scattering in the system. So, that is the reason for uh, a gap that vanishes in the zero temperature limit. That's that's a very good question. Thank you. But uh, the other explanation is that uh, for uh, when you have plateaus in the Hall uh, resistivity, then uh, the E is perpendicular to J. Uh, the electric field is perpendicular to J, so that calls for a dissipationless transport, uh, which, yeah. which happens which happens only in 2D in presence of a magnetic field. That's right, uh, and both of these are connected. Yeah. So. So these explanations are are essentially the same at a deeper level. Okay, I'll, ask, we'll, yeah. I'll ask a quick question, Pankaj. Uh, so Girish, I, I, I first I, let Girish to ask. Girish, okay, Girish, go ahead. Uh, this is a somewhat technical question because we are working on this. So you mentioned edge state. Yes, edge states are lotic chiral. Lutinger liquid. So there is there is this paper uh, that uh, he mentions that the conductance uh, uh, scaling function, uh, the tunneling conductance scaling functions uh, uh, experimentally exhibits non-universal behavior. Is that uh, confirmed? Experimentally, it is in violation of chern simon theory. I mean. Okay, I could not hear. I could not hear the question properly. I'm sorry. There was some problem with the audio. Yeah, there was a problem. I mean, there was no. Uh, you were inaudible at uh, you know intermittently. Yes. Yeah, so. Okay, uh, Saurav, you can go ahead because he has to leave also, Professor. Yeah, I, I will ask a quick question. I mean, it doesn't have to be uh, uh, answered immediately. So, uh, suppose I have a, a Coulomb interaction and which I can uh, Fourier transform, uh, which goes as say 1 over Q square. So, I write down a Hamiltonian which consists of kinetic energy of electrons and uh, 1 over Q square kind of uh, potential. Uh, and now I can find out the UKs, that is the wave function. And now if I want to calculate the charn number, uh, the charn number can never be non-integer. So what uh, uh, what kind of TKN and invariants I would get for a fractional quantum Hall effect? Or is it the winding number of the composite fermions that uh, would be the invariant here? So the way it works for fractional Hall effect is, let's say you go to filling factor two-fifths, or let's say you are at filling factor one third, then you will find that there are three degenerate ground states. Or at filling factor, so let's say to calculate turn number, I have to put the system in periodic boundary condition. So let's say you think of a torus. Yeah. That torus, you would find that the ground state is multiply degenerate. So the degeneracy goes like the denominator of the filling factor. Yes. So just to take and take the example of filling factor one third, there are three degenerate ground states. Now, if you calculate the churn number of any of them, it's not well defined, but the sum of the churn numbers of three degenerate ground states is equal to one. Okay. okay. So on average, the churn number of each one is equal to one third. Okay. Yeah. So that's the way you can understand the fractionally quantized Hall resistance in terms of integrally valued churn numbers. Yeah. yeah. And okay. is there a sort of non-conformal thing about the velocity of the particle at the edges? I don't know what you mean by non-conformal. I mean, uh, what I mean is that uh, are these uh, velocities uh, of the electrons at the edges of the sample, would they be same at the top edge and the bottom edge? I mean, at opposite edges, is that always uh, there? No, but they don't have to be. The the value of the Hall resistance uh, does not depend on the velocity. So they don't have to be the same. It has nothing to do with uh, the basic physics okay. of the phenomenon. Okay. okay. Uh, friends, I have to unfortunately leave. Uh, yeah. So my apologies for that, but um, 
but if there are any questions we can talk at some other time please send me an email okay yeah sure. thank you sure, sure, sure. thank you talk. so much thank you yeah. so much excellent talk okay. please take care of yourself bye now bye bye bye, bye. nice talk huh i mean yeah very nice yeah. i mean uh, it's like listening it from the horse's mouth uh, <laughs> <laughs> no he single handedly uh, invented all these things so invented all this and in fact when he was doing that i uh, was i met him at ictp at that time at that yes. time uh, composite for me on came out and uh, i met him at I ictp i was a young graduate student i just joined phd uh, yeah. and and he was you know uh, he could uh, he was trying to explain i didn't understand much but uh, but really those books that uh, he has shown yeah. the books are very hard to read i see <laughs> very hard to read it's not it's not easy at all i mean his talk is much easier i see to follow But anyway, good. thanks, Pankaj. Thank you. No, it, it was good talk. Very good talk. Thanks, <laughs> thanks you too, <laughs> because you yeah. basically invited him. Uh, no, the way he uh, imagine all the things or uh, model the things, it is quite interesting because he simply uh, by looking the experimental data, he got the idea. Yeah, because yeah. He, he didn't solve it and uh, he didn't uh, basically did the computer simulation. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is all. Uh, this is all by just seeing the this thing. This I he explained at that moment. I still remember that uh, that how he arrived. It is just that I have forgotten and uh, many things I could not connect. I don't work on the fractional quantum Hall effect. I'm more like into the integer quantum Hall. I see. I see. I see Joya in the this thing. What are you right. doing, Joya? Yes, sir. Yeah. How are you and How where are you? And where are you? I just came to home, sir. I'm after finishing MSc. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Well, I, yeah, sir. Okay. Oh. All right. So, um, so you're preparing for interviews and all that. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All the best. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. All the best. Quite late now. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.